It is another lovely day and I'd like to say a very big thank you to all of you who have been keeping KTN Farmers TV. And today on This Week in Agriculture, I'm joined by Patrick Njuguna. Patrick, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, let's start by you telling us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Uh, Patrick Njuguna is an animal nutritionist who works for Dairy Networks Limited. It's a company that uh, does dairy trainings for farmers, does dairy consultancy. And uh, they are there just to help the farmers and for them to make good uh, profits and they just shift from their normal uh, losses. Okay. Thank you very much, Patrick. That is Patrick. You've heard from Patrick. He's an animal nutritionist. I'm your host, Philip Keitan. Let's start by looking at one of our first stories for today. The Ministry of Agriculture has remained mum over the decrease in milk prices in the country. This is amid an outcry by farmers. The high rainfall that has been raining since May this year and the imports from neighboring Uganda has pushed down the prices of the commodity to record lows. Katika siku za hivi karibuni wakulima wa ng'ombe nchini Kenya wamekuwa nalalamika kwamba bei ya maziwa imeonekana kwenda chini sababu zikose kujulikana baadhi wanadai labda kuna maziwa kutoka taifa mataifa nje ambayo yanaingia humo nchini na kufanya bei ya wakulima wa huku kuweza kuathirika na kando na hayo pia tumeona bei ya vyakula vya mifugo ambavyo wakulima hawa wananunua vikiwa vimeenda juu kwa hivyo vimekuwa ni changamoto kubwa sana kwa hususan ya kwamba wanatumia pesa nyingi kuzalisha maziwa lakini wanapokwenda kuya uza bei na shuka chini nitazungumza na mkulima mmoja katika eneo la Kakamega ambaye tayari amenifahamisha alikuwa anauza maziwa lita moja shilingi sitini, sasa bei imeshuka nimekuja shilingi hamsini katuambie kilimo chako cha ngombe wa maziwa kimekuwaje bei tunasikia imeenda chini umeweza kuathirika eh yeah, be, be ya maziwa imerudi chini manake Uh, tulikuwa tukiuza shilingi sitini na sasa imerudi paka shilingi ya msini. sasa tunashindwa kujua ni kwa nini lakini uh, tukijaribu kuuliza wale ambao eh, wakulima wenzetu wenye wanatembea nje wanasema ya kwamba maziwa inatoka nje za nje kwa wingi sasa ikitoka kwa wingi sasa inafanya mpaka ukulima wa ngombe umeadhirika kabisa 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 labda mlikuwa mnauza lita moja pesa ngapi na sasa hivi Tulikuwa tunauza lita moja shilingi sitini na sasa imerudi kwa shilingi ya msini. Sasa na hilo ndilo tegemeo letu kwa ukulima, kusomesha watoto, sisi wenyewe kukula, utuseme mahitaji ya mwanadamu ya kawaida. Hata kama ni matibabu tunategemea ngombe. Lakini sasa ukiona e, pato letu la ngombe limerudi chini na mna hivyo e, maisha inabadilika kabisa mpaka hata tunashindwa tufanye nini. Na, na sababu nyingine ambayo labda inahusishwa na kushuka kwa bei kwa sababu watu wanasema pia hawana pesa za kununua maziwa. Ya sababu nyingine tukiangalia tunaona haswa uchumi wa Kenya umerudi chini. Sasa wanunuzi ni wengi lakini uchumi umewaadhiri mpaka imefanya eh, mauzaji wa maziwa umerudi chini sana sana na labda bei ya chakula cha mifugo pia tunamnalia kwamba imepanda juu labda ndio sababu kubwa inafanya wakulima wengi wanaacha sasa kuzalisha maziwa um, bei ya vyakula ilikuwa mzuri ilikuwa chini lakini sasa kuanzia mwezi wa nne tano hivi bei ya vyakula vya ngombe pamoja na madawa yote ilienda juu sasa hata unashindwa kumlinda ngombe ni ngumu maana yake maziwa inapotoka ndani haipati wateja vizuri Ukienda kununua chakula cha ngombe bei iko juu hujauza maziwa wewe mwenyewe unataka kula mfanyikazi anataka kumshahara wake mali umepanda nyazi wenye inatakana utengeneze sasa hali ya ukulima imezidi kuwa ngumu na labda mnatarajia nini kifanyike labda upande wa serikali upande wa nyinyi binafsi uh, sana sana tunategemea serikali serikali kwanza e, ijaribu ya kwamba maziwa haitoki nje iwe tu ni maziwa yetu sisi ambayo sisi wenyewe tunazalisha pia upande wa vyakula vya ngombe e, serikali isiruhusu wauzaji wa vyakula vya ngombe mtu kuweka bei venye anataka kwa sababu inatuadhiri sana E, karibu hapa tuambie tu biashara imekuwaaje mzana lalamika bei ya maziwa imeshuka chini chakula ni bei gali labda mnafikiria kufanya nini sasa Uh, mimi kwa majina ni Josephine Shiwani. Mimi ni mkulima. 
lakini bado tumejikaza kwa maana ni kazi ambayo tulikuwa tumezoea na bado tumejikaza nayo lakini serikali kama ingekuwa vizuri ingesaidia watu wa wakulima wa, wa kwa upande wa kuwasaidia na vitu kama chakula za ngombe ziko juu e, vyote tu hata chumvi hata madawa zimekuwa juu kwa hivyo tunahitaji usaidizi na pia sales e, tukisaidiwa na serikali ku, kuzuia maziwa ya kutoka nje nafikiri sales itakuwa tu mzuri. Sana kwa hivyo hizo ni baadhi ya kauli ya wakulima wanaofuga ngombe wa maziwa ambao wanasema bei ya maziwa imekuwa ikishuka chini na imeweza kuweka katika hali ambayo ni tetanishi maana hawajui hatima yao sasa itakuwa ni ipi wanaomba serikali kuweza kuwasaidia. Patrick, what is your opinion or what do you think about uh, this story um, milk glut and the low prices? I don't believe so much on the milk glut. But I, uh, but it's factual. The milk prices are low. The worst I've had is uh, 17 shillings per liter. And on, the, like you have said on that story, I'll wish to see the data from the meteorological department. And if it's true, it has been raining from May, because in most region, around the month of August and September, it was a bit dry. And now, you can see it was dry. We have shifted all of a sudden to a milk glut. So I just believe there is no much of the milk glut. Maybe what could have happened due to the economy, the consumption of milk per capita has gone down. Then that one would agree there is a milk glut, but because the consumers are not consuming the milk. But that doesn't mean the farmers are producing more. Because again, most of the farmers are crying, their production is very low. And now the milk prices are also very low. The cost of and again, the cost of production have gone up, so the farmers are just in a very big mess. So, what does it what does it mean to the farmer when um, the milk of uh, milk at the moment is that low, uh, and the cost of production, as you say, is really high? Uh, the farmers are making losses. The farmers are really crying. Farms are being closed down. Farmers are selling their cows. So basically, you, the source of living for most small scale farmers has really gone down. Okay, so going forward, um, what advice could you give to the dairy farmers going forward? Uh, I'd like the dairy farmers first to get rid of the inefficiencies in their farm. That one will bring down the cost of, uh, the cost of production. Again, they just observe the pattern of milk production and they produce when there is scarcity. Not when there is the glut. Uh. And with, with uh, you know, this is an annual thing. When it's dry, we complain um, there is not enough milk in the country. And we even contemplate importing some more. When we have uh, more rains, we complain that uh, the milk is a lot and the prices go down. What do we need to do as a country to make sure that uh, we have a constant uh, price for our milk, both for the consumers and for the farmers? Uh, Number one, the government hope to buy all the excess milk and they just convert it to powder. That one will be the first one. Number two, farmers need to secure their fodder very well. Again, this milk glut comes from the pastoral communities. Not really the pastoral community, but those people who practice grazing. When it's dry, they don't have feed for their cows. When it rains, there is a plenty of, of grass and then we have that excess. So the government needs to address that one and how they can handle those excess milk, not in the expense of the farmers who are in the zero grazing, who have done everything right, but the prices goes down. Sometimes they say, if you're a small scale farmer, it's very hard for you to, to make ends meet because of the high cost of production. So for a farmer to be uh, productive and profitable, how many cows or how big of a farm do they need to have? Um, for a farmer to have a viable business, needs at least 10 cows. And at any given time, six cows are being milked. That way, a farmer will have a good, and then uh, roughly an average of 20 liters per cow. So that farmer has 120 liters daily. If the milk prices was to stabilize between 35 and, uh, 35 and 40 shillings, and the cost of production to be as low as 20 shillings. That farmer has 15 to 20 shillings profit. 
and remember he has 120 liters that one is about 1000 and something in a month that's almost 40000 that farmer will have good profit and do you think our farmers are well uh, sensitized enough on some of these issues especially the things we've talked about because um, almost 70 percent of the population are farmers but are they aware that um, for them to be profitable they need um, at least 10 cows out of the 70 percent who are farmers are probably 10 percent they're the ones who have who are really practicing the kilimo biashara or who are taking their business to be a profit generating business okay. so they don't have that information what do, what do we need to do as a country to make sure that even that 60 percent also start doing uh, kilimo biashara we only need to revive uh, the extension department that one is under the ministry of agriculture and agriculture being a devolved function that one lies squarely to the county government we need to really need to revive that extension we really need to dispense this information to farmers we've also seen uh, uh, issues whereby the government, especially the other day we saw the Kenya Dairy Board and uh, Kenya Bureau of Standards, they uh, arrested some traders who are importing powdered milk from other countries. What does this mean to the country and especially uh, dairy farmers in the country who are now uh, complaining of low prices? When you have that now, that, uh, that milk powder, and uh, rumors has it that it's being reconstituted to the fresh milk. So it means that our milk prices will never go up. Because the market, the consumers will always be happy they are getting milk at a subsidized price or the cost at the shelf is very low. And that one is a resultant of, and all that resources is not going back to the farmer, but it's going to just a selected few individuals. Who is exactly supposed to, to teach farmers on, on hygiene when it comes to the production of milk and, and making sure that the milk they produce is of high quality? That's the role of the government, and not just the government. That's the role of the county government. Agriculture being a devolved function. They must make sure that the farmers have sustainable business and their produce are of high quality. And for you to get this high quality, you must dispense this information. If it comes to the pri private uh, practitioners, they have to charge to dispense that information. And you get most of the farmers can't afford. Most of the small-scale farmers can't afford. But if you strengthen the extension department under the Ministry of Agriculture, then this information will be readily available to the farmers. And the farmers will produce super quality products. Thank you very much, Patrick. I'm sure our dairy farmers and the country has learned a little bit about what we need to do to make sure that um, our farmers also make money at the end of the day. And on, on that note, I think we'll move to another story of, that we have for today. A lot of concerns have been raised by Kenyans in regard to the quality and the safety of what we consume. The latest warning by the Kenya Bureau of Standard touches on the maize flour, where particular brands were suspended for having high levels of aflatoxin. However, this week some of the maize flour has been given a clean bill of health and are being allowed back to the shelves. In a notice released on the 9th of November 2019 by the Kenya Bureau of Standards, five brands of maize flour were noted to be unsafe for consumption. The five included Dola, Kifaru, Sterehe, Tuten and Jembe, which failed to meet the relevant standards due to high levels of aflatoxin. But in a turn of events, the two of the blacklisted five brands have been given a clean bill. The two brands, Dola and Kifaru, have had their ban lifted. Kebs noted that the two brands have duly followed the required corrective actions, which include recalling of all batches, mandatory testing of raw materials before milling, control measures in in- and post-process storage, and maintenance of appropriate records. Apart from maize flour products, early November saw Kebs recall seven peanut butter brands, namely Zasta, Nuts, True Nuts, Supermill, Sue's Naturals, Fresi, and Nutty by Nature. In the new directive, True Food Zester and Jetlux Nuts have regained their licenses. As for the maize products, Kenyans are left wondering whether in 11 days it was truly possible to recall all affected products and take corrective measures to give the brands a clean bill of health. First of all, what is your opinion about uh, the burning and the high levels of aflatoxin on our maize flour. Aflatoxin is there, 
it's an issue that uh, we should discuss. I'm not just really touching on uh, the Kenya Bureau of Standards, not really touching on the manufacturers, but we should look at it on the entire value chain. And we correct whatever mistakes have been happening there. Aflatoxin is not just affecting uh, maize flour, it's also affecting the animal feed, because we understand that um, most farmers or most manufacturers, when they realize what they have as either raw material for a particular product, if it's not meeting the human consumption levels, they move it to the animal. Do you think we also need to make sure what our animals are eating is safe? Uh, we need to make sure what our animals consume is safe because it poses a health hazard to them. And some of their aflatoxin, especially the B1, might end up to the milk, to the meat, and it poses a health hazard to the human being. Animals, especially the cows, will be able to tolerate some levels of aflatoxin. But there are some strains that they can't be able to degrade. And that's what ends up in the milk and also the meat. And the human consume it. So it, if it's not safe for human, it shouldn't be safe for animals. Is there a way a farmer can be helped to, to know that this maize is dry enough? Because sometimes a farmer can look at his maize and say, he make a vizuri. But maybe it's not really dry. Yeah, there is a way. We have the moisture meter, which is which you can uh, just test your, your series and know the moisture level. The government can chip in and buy those maize very fast. It's a season, maybe it's two, three months season. They buy that maize at that time. And then the government takes up the role to go and dry those, those maize. So there is a way we can do it. Our grandparents uh, used to dry the maize. What procedure did they use? Is it the time we revert back to them? Or is it the time we invent bugs or maybe something like a litmus paper that can detect if the moisture level is below 15, the color changes to this. If it's below 13, it changes to this. If it's above 20, this, how the, 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 that, uh, that litmus paper will behave. And that, that, that one will really help these farmers. How learned our farmers uh, to even understand what aflatoxin is in the first place? I think we have a problem. The data from, I think, the Minister of Agriculture has it the average age of a farmer in Kenya is 50 to 52 years. And... Uh, that tells it all. That tells it all. To, to solve some of these issues that we have currently, do you think we need now to encourage more young people to to go back home and help these aging farmers and take over slowly and even uh, mechanize these farms um, into the 21st century farms that we would wish to have? I think it's long overdue, but again, uh, the youths are not willing. There are no incentives. And uh, by incentives, I mean there is no success rate. Everyone can see our, our parents are anguishing in poverty because of farming. So you wouldn't wish to, to join them and to be a failure. Everyone follows where there is success. So if you can have success stories on agriculture, the maize farmers, how they are, they, they, they are, they are doing much better, then we, automatically the youths will go and invest there. But now... I totally agree with you. But um, let, let's go back to the food safety and the aflatoxin issue. Um, there's also a maize miller that... Uh, one, uh, one of his, two of his brands had been uh, banned by Kenya Bureau of Standards. And then I think yesterday or the other day they were cleared that they were fit for human consumption. But the company went ahead and complained that they lost almost um, 500 million shillings. So I, I was asking myself, were they right to complain that they lost money yet? It depends on where they source the maize. Because if they got it from NCPB, they, are, they opt to complain. It also depends on the maize that was tested or the flour that was, was tested, where they got it from. If it was from the shelves and what they had in their own stores was fit, it means that it means they are in those stores or in the distributors, they were not able to store that flour very well and it accumulated the, their flour toxin. So it really, we really need to know at what point did did that flour get a aflatoxin? Is it at the milling point? Is it before buying the maize? Is it after? Then we can say whether the complaint is genuine or not. Okay, I totally agree with you. 
where we ought really to, to find out. We might, we might be accusing the wrong people for, for not uh, really doing any, any wrong. So, um, so does it mean Kebs now needs to, every time before Amila sends their product to market, they need to test it? The manufacturer is to be blamed based on uh, now the, 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 the inputs. If he buys maize that has a flatoxin, he has to carry the burden. But again, when you dispense your product to the market, how will the manufacturer and any follow up to make sure in that local kiosk, the storage is good? It hasn't accumulated a flatoxin, or the flatoxin hasn't emanated from that kiosk, from that shop, from that supermarket. Is it the run of the manufacturer or is it the run of the cabs? Sure. But also uh, in the last few uh, weeks or months, we've seen stories that have come out that um, either from meat, now we are talking about flour. What does this say about us as a country? Uh, that we put money uh, fast uh, ahead of our health? And, and, and then we go ahead and spend too much money uh, in hospitals. Does it mean we don't care about our health as a country? Um, we, we care, but I think there is a group of people who doesn't care about the welfare of others. They're not human. They don't have that human heart. And I think we can't judge the entire population, whereas it's just a selected few who are doing it. Very true. So going forward, what do we need to, know, to do as a country to ensure that um, everything that goes to the consumer is of high quality and of, uh, 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 meets all the health uh, parameters? We need to implement uh, the policies and uh, regulations that exist. And we make sure that people have the real information and what it really matters. For instance, I'll just look at it not just from uh, the not just from the manufacturer point of view or the regulator's point of view, just that local farmer or just local, uh, or just, not just farmer who has produced maize, kept the maize wrongly, accumulated a flatoxin, and then goes and mills that maize. That farmer, we can't blame the manufacturer there, we can't blame the regulator, but we'll, we'll blame this farmer doesn't have that information. So we really need to look at this thing on different perspectives. Oh, I totally agree with you, Patrick. We need to really follow up and uh, make sure that the whole system is clean and that everybody is doing their work. Soil experts have warned that food production yields in the coming years might dwindle due to the drop in soil fertility. The experts insist that pro productivity will mainly be hampered by the land de degradation, climate change, drought and deforestation. The imminent food shortage has been attributed to overcultivation, soil erosion caused by floods, and misuse of fertilizers. The experts also cautioned about the ever growing population and failure to practice crop rotation. Calvin Jodisi is the CEO and founder of Ascenti, a non profit forum that trains SMEs, startups, and different stakeholders on entrepreneurship and innovation from across Africa. We are still the normal, you know, the normal grow maize and you know so you find that our 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 farms are not like the soil is not really really pre prepared to fight some of the you know some of the uh, some of the diseases and all that and so that affects you know affects our soils and so it makes it even more weaker so i think the best thing uh, what i'm seeing in that is that there's need to be able to have like smart farming where um, we can be able to understand the soil and you know do the soil testings and all that which I mean sometimes it's quite expensive and you know uh, back 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 at home we are used of you know oh any season yeah, my Indy, let's let's grow our maize you know this is a season of beans and so if you're going to do something probably mixed maize and beans in in, in that category but um, but what about if we had smart farming where we can be able to actually have probably different season crops and that actually will help even our soil become more stronger uh, so that you know it, it cannot be affected by some kind of pests and, and diseases as well. One of the ways of dealing with soil infertility as Calvin explains is by training farmers on crop rotation as well as encouraging farmers to provide agricultural lime that will improve soil quality by reducing acidity thus boosting food production. The nutritional values of our soils have really degenerated over the years and that something needs to be done if we are to continue producing high quality crops. 
where do we need to start from? We need to start from the soil analysis. That's now the bottom line. We need to do, we need to test our soil. We need to know what is in that soil and we be ready to break our cultural practices. I, am, I, I, I call them cultural practices because what our grandparents did, what our parents did, is what exactly even as the young generation we are doing. So our soil has really degenerated. It's up to us now to start doing the soil testing. Why has it taken us this long to really realize that we really need to take care of our soils? Because we never valued agriculture long before as a business. Number two, the output has declined. Number three, the population has increased. As the output decreases, the population is growing. So there is high demand for food. So now people have started to realize we used to do better long days ago and now we are not doing good. And that's, that forms the genesis why more research has been done on our soil and why it's degenerating. Does it mean only uh, crop farmers are the ones who are supposed to do soil tests? It's not only the crop farmers. Because again, even those who keep livestock and livestock consume the, the fodder or those crops, they really need to do the soil analysis to make sure that whatever they feed their cows is of high quality or the animals is of high quality and the output from those animals increases. Be it meat, be it milk, be it eggs. Uh, we really need to look at that. Not just the crop, but also the animal farmers. Maybe a farmer is really willing to test their soils, but the big question for them will be, so where am I taking it? In your trainings, in your many trainings that you do with farmers, what are some of the um, many questions that you get when it comes to uh, soil and crop production? Number one, they complain about the output. Like someone will say, I used to harvest 40 bags in 80s and 90s, but not even getting 10 bags in an acre is a challenge. So that one is a direct complaint. Number two, these talk of uh, in those years, we used to graze our animals and they used to produce better. The fertility was very good, but now we zero graze them, we expected more output, again we have less output. And actually others say, if it weren't for land limitation, I'd rather go back to, to the grazing. And you can see there are really those real complaints. What, what are some of the answers you give them, especially for those two questions? Uh, we really need to do the soil analysis. We really need to know what kind of seed to use, what kind of fertilizers to use. I think the government is doing a lot on this aspect, on the research. Most of our research institutions, they have a lot of information. That information is lying on that, on the shelves. On the shelves. Is it the time some of these parastatos, like the, the Kalnero, they have a budget for extension? Because again, they assume that the county government, through the, their Minister of Agriculture, will get that information from them and dispense to the farmers, which is not happening. Is it time that this information, this parastatos, dispenses this information to, directly to, to the farmers? Through maybe field days, through maybe trainings, and maybe it could solve something. Thank you very much, Patrick. I think. On that point of the government need to dispense more of the information they have on the shelves from the research, from the many research they've done. I think that will be a very good point to take a break, but we will be back shortly. Don't touch that dial.